Great, and well, welcome. We're going to be talking about soap notes. Uh, the idea behind today is we'll talk not only soap notes, but we'll also discuss legalities and best practices. Uh, this is something that comes up a lot, be it in Facebook groups or on comments and questions within my orthopedic assessment class. And even though soap notes is something that we all have to do every single day, it's really good to refresh these ideas. So we're going to do that today. And first off, let's start with a bit of a discussion as to what we'll be covering. The first thing we're going to talk about is intake forms, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but we'll review some very important concepts. This is also going to include consent forms. From there, we're going to talk about soap notes in general, go through a review as to what to write in each section for subjective objective assessment and plan. After that, we'll talk about EHR, so that's electronic health records, and EMR, electronic medical records, the same thing, and how they're incredibly helpful when it comes to taking your soap notes and clinic management in general. And then we'll get into legalities. By legalities, I mean what happens if, say, a lawyer or insurance company contacts you and asks you for uh, a copy of your soap notes? How do you handle a situation like that? And how do you make sure that your soap notes are following all of the rules and regulations that exist all over the place, not just in Alberta or Canada, but there's pretty universal rules to, to how to take proper soap notes? And then lastly, we'll finish off with a question and answer. And again, when it comes to that Q&A, just ask a question in the comments section. Uh, I'm going to keep an eye on that as we go through the course. So if you have any questions at all as we do go through this material, uh, let me know. And on that note, if you wouldn't mind, uh, for those of you who are here, just give me a little thumbs up or a yes or something in the... Uh, in the comments section, just so I can make sure that you can hear me and see me okay, and then we'll we'll jump into it. Wonderful. Everything's going good then. Thank you, Alyssa. That's great. Okay, so let's uh, let's start with just talking about intake forms. Uh, so with intake forms, they're pretty simple, pretty straightforward. There are a few things that are needed. So if you've been practicing for a little bit, a uh, little bit of time, or you're you know, you've been in the industry for a while, there's going to be nothing unusual here. Uh, nevertheless, we will talk about the important things to remember. Every single intake form requires these things by law. So you do have to have all of these details on, and ideally more. Uh, hello, Jordan from Lethbridge. It's, I'm glad you're here. And same with you, Lori. Oh, good to see you, Lori. Uh, so you do need a name, and that's uh, a legal name as well as a preferred name. Date of birth, you need a gender, and if they prefer not to say gender, you can have that on the form as well. Prefer not to say or other. Uh, you do need an address, and that needs to be kept up to date, and that's actually a very important point. When we think about intake forms, we usually think this is an intake form that you do once and that's it. But if any of this information changes, it needs to be updated. So if you're doing all of this intake process by paper, you need to set a note in your calendar to make sure maybe it's every January and every July. You ask all of your clients who book in, are there any changes to your, your address, your phone number, to your information like that? just so you can keep these up to date. Now we'll talk a lot about, about uh, electronic health records and a lot of those have this automatically in there. Anytime somebody books an appointment, there's a little reminder saying, hey, has anything changed? Is all this information still accurate and correct? Now occupation, that doesn't actually legally need to be in there, but I strongly encourage you to have occupation on all of your intake forms. And the reason is that one question alone, without getting into any form of inquiry, not getting any details of the subjective part of our soap notes, just knowing somebody's occupation oftentimes gives you a pretty good idea as to what's contributing to different dysfunctions. So I find that to be by far the most important question we can ask as far as helping me in my practice. After that, we have contact information that needs to be phone number. Ideally, it's the phone number they're going to be reached at more often than not. You could also have their business phone number and their email. Email is not necessary, but you do usually want to have it if you're going to be communicating via email. And then lastly, emergency contact, and that one is required. So that's the things that are required on all intake forms, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So let's talk about consent forms. Now, consent forms, what's very important to note is that each one of these have to be at the front of a file. So if you're keeping paper files, it has to be at the front. 
If you're keeping files, say you're using Google Docs or Microsoft Word, and we'll talk about the legalities of that in a little bit. If you are using one of these word processors to keep your soap notes, then this has to be the first document, it has to be very easy to access, and they are not the same as a waiver. I cannot emphasize that enough. There's a big difference between a consent form and a waiver. A consent form is somebody saying, I understand what is happening and I consent to this treatment. A waiver, on the other hand, this is when somebody waives their right, meaning they can't sue you for any reason. A consent form, they still can. On the consent form, it might say very clearly that you as the therapist are going to be performing myofascial cupping. And on the consent form, it says super clearly that myofascial cupping can cause bruising. Even though it says that and they consent to it, they can still technically sue you if you cause bruising. Now, they're not going to win because it's on your consent form, but they're allowed to go through the process. And now the issue with that is it's an expensive process, even if you do win. A waiver, on the other hand, means they waive the right to pursue legal action. We cannot get people to sign waivers. We can only get them to sign consent forms. So that's the big difference between a waiver and a consent form. So now let's talk about understanding SOAP notes. And again, if you do have questions, by all means, ask them as I go through this, but I will save a little bit of time at the very end to, to cover any questions that you might have. So when we talk about SOAP notes, this is a standardized system. The history behind SOAP notes, well, it's kind of interesting, at least in my opinion it is. The history behind SOAP notes is nurses. It all started with nurses originally, and they decided that they needed some sort of standardized system to communicate with one another within a specific hospital. Because even within different shifts, say the day shift versus the night shift, there was a huge discrepancy on how notes were being kept. So it was largely to keep track of what another practitioner was doing. And over time, this started to become adopted by different hospitals. So a patient could go from one hospital to another, they could bring their file to the other hospital, and all of the practitioners would understand the general idea of what was being done. So again, standardized. And then from there, it began to be adopted more and more and more until soap notes now are generally accepted in all major health facilities. This is hospitals down to a massage therapy clinic. It's a way to standardize things to make sure that the right information is gathered. But what is important to know is that each profession is going to have different information that they will gather. Meaning the information that I gather when I'm practicing, say, acupuncture, is very different, well, maybe not very different, but to some extent different than the information I gather when I'm practicing as a massage therapist, or I even take some form of soap notes when I'm doing coaching. So the information gathered is different, but the process is the same. The type of information is the same. If a surgeon were to, for some reason, look at your soap notes, if they're done correctly, they should have a pretty good idea what they're reading because it is a standardized system. Okay. So the first is subjective, of course, objective, assessment, and plan. And now what we're going to do is talk about each one of these. And as we go through each one, I'm going to be talking about the thing that you should be writing and then the common mistakes, errors, and issues that I have seen both supervising clinics and that I've seen come up a lot in different courses I've taught. So the purpose then, the purpose is to help organize the treatment. This is beyond the reason soap notes were invented. What are the purposes of the, the soap notes? Well, they're designed to help organize the treatment. They give you a general flow as far as not just this one treatment, but treating a client in general, session after session. They help you organize your thoughts. When you are treating complicated conditions, and this does indeed happen in massage therapy, right? I'm sure you've had somebody come in and they've got a sore shoulder and you just can't figure out why, even when you do the best assessment on the planet, you still can't quite figure out why. It helps you organize your thoughts and what you're going to be doing. Next, it also allows you to record treatment goals as well as the plan of progress. That's something that I don't see a lot. Oftentimes when people write their soap notes, they forget about the fact that you can write the outcome. What do they want out of this? That's an important question to ask within the subjective area. What are your expectations? Helps you create a treatment goal and therefore you create a plan. So you're starting to see that the main purpose behind them isn't just to keep documents, it really is to help you as a practitioner. 
and the more detailed your soap notes are, I can assure you, the better. But we'll talk about how to shrink the amount of time you spend because if you want to be really detailed with soap notes, it take a really long time. And lastly, they are a legal document that can be used by third parties. What I mean by that is, you can be asked by a lawyer or by an insurance company to produce a copy of your soap notes for a specific client. And because your soap notes are part of a file that contain a full name and a birth date, they're legal documents. So they are there to, in this, in this instance, they're there to help the patient if the patient is seeking further help from, say, an insurance company, but they can also be there to help the insurance company if the roles are reversed. Perhaps there's a patient or a client who's trying to abuse the insurance system and your soap notes can help that. Now, we'll talk a little bit about insurance, but oftentimes when I make that point in class, students bring up the fact, well, it's fine, you know, you can, insurance companies can afford it. I'm sure they can, but the fact is insurance fraud eventually costs everybody. So we do need to do our best to make sure that our clients are following the appropriate procedures when it comes to insurance claims. All right, we'll talk more about that in legalities. Oh, one more point here. It acts as uh, to protect the practitioner if the patient has any concerns regarding their treatment. Uh, so this happens if, say, um, you're massaging somebody's glutes and they decide after the treatment that that was inappropriate behavior. However, during the massage, during the treatment, you asked very clearly saying, is it okay if I massage your glutes? And I do want to take a moment and, and make sure I emphasize that phrasing. When you ask somebody to work on a specific area that might be sensitive or might lead to issues, ask, don't tell. The difference is, may I please work on your glutes? Is it okay if I work on your upper chest? Is a huge difference that, uh, huge different from, I'm going to work on your glutes, okay? That's telling them what you're going to do. Now that difference is key because if you say the words, I'm going to work on your glutes, okay? They don't really have a choice. They could say no, but that phrasing more often than not leads people to just go, okay, even if they're not comfortable. On the other hand, if you approach that question a little bit more delicately saying, is it okay if I work on your glutes? If that's not okay, that's completely acceptable. So you see how the phrasing really changes things. Regardless, you want to write that in your soap notes. If you do work on the glutes, say verbal permission to work on glutes. Uh, I would also say do that for the adductors, do it for the upper chest, anywhere that's even remotely sensitive, even intraoral, this can be relatively invasive. So making sure that you write exactly what you did can save you if somebody tries to come after you for some sort of legal reason. Okay, so subjective information. What's going on in the subjective information? This is the component that's a very detailed narrative of the client's self-reported story. So it's their story. It's them telling you about what the issue is. It includes their symptoms, the entire case history, and they describe it in their own words. And this is all part of the history section. If you've ever taken my orthopedic assessment uh, program, you know that I separate things into taking a history and then going through observation. So I call it the HOMS P method. History, observation, movement, special tests, palpation. Yes, uh, so within that system, the history is all the subjective. Now, the subjective part, it's their story. This is important though, because time is of the essence. With massage, more often than not, when somebody walks in, they want to be on the table, right? They're paying for an hour-long massage. They want an hour-long massage. They don't want a 15-minute inquiry and assessment. So the questions you ask, they should be quite concise. And again, I have covered this in other lectures. Uh, but do your very best to get the information as precisely and concisely as possible. Nevertheless, sometimes you'll ask a client, what brings you in today? And they start telling you this huge, long-winded story. I mean, they're going on and on and on about who knows what. So this is their subjective part of it, right? They're telling you their story, but don't necessarily be afraid to interrupt. If they start to go too far off track, you can steer them back and say, okay, tell me more about the shoulder. Where does it hurt? What happened? So get it in their own words and write it as close to their own words as possible within reason. You're not writing down their whole life story, but try and get their own words. 
particularly the description of what it feels like. If you say, well, what does it feel like? And they say it's deep, agging, gnawing pain, however they describe it. Get it in their own words. So the subjective part really is the easiest part. A little bit later, we'll talk about how to shrink this down and shorten as much as possible using shorthand. But most of the time, you're going to spend majority, I shouldn't say the majority, because when we get into the treatment plan, that takes a while too. You spend a lot of time on this subjective part. Now, these are some common mistakes that I, I have seen when I was doing clinic supervision. Passing judgment on a patient, meaning the patient is overreacting again, you know, they, if they have any emotional statements and you decide that something is happening, this isn't the place for any of your subjective experiences. This is all their stuff. So don't pass any judgments. And the next is documenting irrelevant information. If the if you say, have you had this treatment before? And they're like, yes, I went to my last therapist and they were awful, they didn't treat me at all. Or maybe they say, I go to physio, but they don't do anything at all. You can write, has been to physio and did not see results, but you can't, really, rather, you shouldn't really be writing about all of the, the details and the nitty gritty of the client complaining about, well, anything other than their presenting issue. And then lastly, uh, maybe that's, yeah, that, that's the last point, including opinions. So the patient, uh, opinions about the patient, I should be more specific, patient was willing to participate. Uh, this might be something you would more write in objective. Um, if they're willing to actually go through the process and procedure, maybe they're not because it's painful, or maybe they're not because they simply don't want to. The subjective is not your subjective opinion. It's not your opinion. It's theirs. It's their subjective experience of what they're going through. So there's no place for opinions when it comes to this. All right, next we'll talk about objective. Objective, uh, you know, I find the objective part interesting because this outlines the results of your orthopedic assessment, right? Uh, this is where you take notes of the posture, the pain behaviors, movement, range of motion, special tests, palpation, all of those things. And now the reason I find this to be kind of interesting is because although technically speaking, the objective part of our assessment should take the most time, most massage therapists, they don't do. Now, there's no judgment there. I understand. Time is of the essence, right? Like, you need to make sure you're doing the most you can with the limited time you have. And quite frankly, the objective part of the assessment tends to get put by the wayside. So, quite frankly, the majority of the time, the objective part, it's going to be pretty minimal. You know, you might palpate and be like soreness on just lateral to the right acromion or something like that, right? So again, it's likely going to be very, very minimal. However, if you do do a thorough assessment where you're writing all of the details, the more detail, the better. Because this objective part, this is what helps you identify if you're making progress. From one session to another, you need to know is what you're doing actually helping. Now, if you spend the majority of your time doing relaxation massages, this isn't that important, you know? Do you feel more relaxed? Yes, no, it's pretty simple. And I want to be clear, that's not disparaging relaxation treatments. I personally believe that a good relaxation massage is as value, in many cases, even more valuable than a therapeutic massage. At any rate, you're going to write all of your test results here in as much detail as possible. This, again, this is for you. This is to keep track of the progress that you're making from one session to another. Now, the uh, common mistakes I see on here is way too little detail. Now, again, if you don't have time, you're not going to have a lot of detail, but whatever it is you do do, make sure that you're using as much detail as you possibly can. Next. We have the assessment portion. Now, this is where things get a little bit tricky because different practitioners and different clinics are going to do things a little bit differently. But in my opinion, this is the interpretation of the information gathered in the subjective and objective sections. At this point, you should have a very clear idea of what you're dealing with. This is your clinical impression, your final assessment, what some might call but certainly shouldn't call a diagnosis. Now, quite frankly, if we could use that word in massage therapy, this would be your diagnosis. What do you actually think the problem is? It's your professional opinion in light of all of the subjective findings, and it should ideally explain your reasoning why. 
That's an important part in the assessment is, I believe that this could potentially be, or something like, this has the clinical, repre or this, this represents or looks like supraspinatus tendonitis. Notice I used all these qualifiers. This could be, possibly, maybe it looks like, because we can't give a diagnosis. And then you would write, why? I believe this might be supraspinatus tendonitis because during active and resisted abduction of the shoulder, there was pain experienced and the drop arm test was positive. That's ideal. That's in a perfect world. You would write that. But you know what? Most people don't. The reality is you don't have to. It's again, just nice. But this is what you think it is. Now, if you're seeing a client on a regular basis, week after week after week, this section is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller because your clinical impression likely is not going to change. Now, there's something else we can write in here. It's also we write notes on how the client is progressing. So if they are making significant improvements, this is where you're going to write that. If it's marginal improvements, you would write making a marginal improvement or, you know, five degrees better, uh, progressing slightly. So these notes can be very, very short. The assessment portion, this shouldn't take you any time at all. Now, the common mistake is note on progress are too vague. Client is improving, fine, but I would prefer to see a client has five more degrees of abduction or something like that. Or a client's subjective pain has decreased from a seven out of 10 to a five out of 10. The more information, the better. But again, even if you're very detailed, this section shouldn't take much time at all. And then that takes us into the plan. Now, second to the subjective information, this is going to take you the most time. And in fact, the longer you've been with a client, the longer this section is going to take. The first section, session, your subjective will be quite long because you're getting a bunch of information, but this will eventually take the majority of time. This is what you are going to do or have done for the treatment. And this is based on the information you've gathered in previous sections meaning your plan should actually be based on what your clinical assessment was and based on the history. If you decided it was supraspinatus tendonitis and your plan turns out to be massage the low back, that plan doesn't match up, doesn't make sense for you, and it doesn't make sense to anybody else who is working on this person after you. And it may also include your plan for subsequent visits. Every visit afterwards, you can write this plan. I think that's really important, particularly if you're working in a multidisciplinary clinic or you're working in a setting where there's many different massage therapists. One complaint that comes from clients, and, and I've spoken to many clients on this, particularly in a multidisciplinary clinic or a setting with multi, multiple therapists, is they say it's kind of frustrating because every single time they go in and they see a different therapist, it's like they got to start from scratch again, or the second therapist does something totally different than the first. Now, of course, that's fine to a degree, because every practitioner is going to do things just a little bit different. But also, continuity is super important. So if you don't have the consistency of working with the same client week after week or session after session, this plan part is very important. You would write, here's what I did in this se session, and be detailed, really detailed. Muscles that you're working on, techniques that you worked on, and if you really want to, you can even write your reason why you did it. But then also write, in the next session, I'm going to do the exact same thing. Or in the next session, I plan on spending a little bit more time on, I don't know, the flexors of the wrist for whatever reason. Now that next visit thing, that should come based on what the client tells you at the end of the session. You finish the session, you're just wrapping up, you know, you're doing your cool down techniques, whatever it might be. And you say, how do you feel? You know, one question I always like to ask is, do you feel like anything was left undone? I really like that question because it helps guide the next session. It's not saying you did a bad job because you did the best you could do, or at least you should be. But asking the client, do you feel like there was anything left undone? It can give you the opportunity to quickly address that area, but also to assure them that next time you're going to spend more time and effort on that area. It indicates to the client that you really do care, that you want them to have an amazing experience. It also gives you a guideline of what to do next and you can start to plan the next session. Lastly, it helps if you're working with other practitioners, it helps with them if they're going to be working on the client as well. 
Now, this should also include home care. Now, home care is sadly neglected amongst many different massage therapists. I'm sure none of you neglect home care because you know how important it is, but it does oftentimes get neglected. And when it comes to home care, this also needs to be very, very detailed. If, let's keep going with supraspinatus tendonitis because it's, it's relatively simple. If you tell them to do pendulums, right, uh, you need to tell them how long to do a pendulum for and with what weight to do a pendulum for. And for those of you who don't know, a pendulum is essentially you lean over and you let the arm just kind of swing. Uh, it's fine for supraspinatus tendonitis. So again, you'd say, if you told your client, do pendulums with a five pound weight for one minute a day in 30 second intervals, write that down in as much detail as you can. Now, what I tend to do is I'll show my client a specific exercise. Um, maybe it is those pendulums, but then I'll also say, and here's a great YouTube video. And I always, well, I shouldn't say always, as often as I can, meaning as often as I have either made videos or if I know there's a really good one on YouTube, I like to send home care videos with my client. I'll just email them later. And I'll write that in the soap notes too. Told my client to do pendulums for 60 seconds a day with a five pound weight and 30 second intervals and sent this YouTube video. Home care, very detailed. Now the common mistakes I see on the plan is too vague. Uh, meaning I massage the leg or uh, what's that? Full FBS and full body Swedish massage. It's not helpful. It's not helpful for you and it's not helpful for anybody else. And the same treatment as last week that's actually not a legitimate thing to write on soap notes. If your soap notes were to be brought into a court setting and it said same as last week, they'd be thrown out. You do have to write detail. Massage leg, that technically counts if it was going to be uh, required in quote court, but you wanna be more detailed than that. Instead of saying massaged leg, you'd say massaged gastroc and soleus, massaged hamstrings. Say the muscles you massage and also ideally say the techniques. Now, if you've been practicing for a certain length of time, you probably have narrowed your technique list down to a very small handful. You might say myofascial release. Perform myofascial release on, uh, I'll often say, on superficial backline. That's fine. SBL, superficial backline. This is an abbreviation. And we'll talk about that shortly of how to actually make sure that that's legitimate. So you can use these shorthand and these abbreviations but you still want to make sure you're relatively detailed. The techniques you did, the tissues that you worked on. All right, so briefly, before we jump into this next session, which is uh, when's the best time to write things down, I cruised through that. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these, these basic ideas. So uh, are there any questions before we jump into when the best time to write your soap notes is? All right, we're looking, we're looking pretty good. If any questions do come in, I'll pause what I'm saying and I'll, I'll get back to the questions. So then, when is the best time to write your soap notes? I actually, I get this question more than anything else. Oh, wait, we got a question from Jody. There it is. How do we get access to the recording? Great question, Jody. Uh, I'm sorry if you asked that earlier. Um, the, the recording is going to be on uh, the AIM Online Facebook page. So as soon as we're done with this event, it's automatically going to be there. I mean, it might take 20 minutes for the upload and all of the Facebook backend stuff to work, but it's going to be there. Additionally, I'm going to be putting it up on our YouTube channel. If you're not familiar with our YouTube channel, it's AIM Online Education on YouTube. Uh, and I do live streams on there as well as upload videos pretty much weekly or every two weeks at the most. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Again, it will be on our Facebook page and it will be on, uh, on YouTube as well. Thanks for the question. So then, back to uh, when is the best time to write them? And I do get this question asked a lot, and it's actually a really good question. Should you write your soap notes uh, during the session? Uh, meaning, not during the massage, obviously, but when you're doing your inquiry. You know, as they're telling you the story, you write it down really quickly. I, I actually don't like that. I don't like that way of doing things. Uh, I think it detracts from the experience of the client giving you the subject of information. Now, when I first started practicing, I brought a clipboard in with me and it just had a scrap piece of paper on so I could scribble notes. I didn't want to forget anything. And on occasion, I still do that, but only if it's a very complicated case, I'll quickly get out a piece of paper so I can make sure I don't forget anything. But for the most part, when it comes to the subject of information, I say if you approach each session like you actually care, it's weird how much you can remember. 
Oh, and Ekaterina has a question. I'll get to that as soon as I'm done th this thought. Uh, it's weird how much you remember when, when you actually do ask questions as if you care about them. And I say as if you care about them because of course you do, but maybe you don't. But the fact is, if you at the very least pretend like you actually care what your client is saying, you remember 99% of what they said. At the very least, you remember the most pertinent details. So I don't really like writing things down during the inquiry. Uh, also, when I write things down, it kind of breaks the flow of the back and forth between my client and I. So I don't really like to go during the session. So we got a question here from Ekaterina. I usually write them in the first 24 hours when the information is still fresh. That's perfect. That actually goes in in the next couple points here. After the session, great. If you've got the time as soon as the session is finished, maybe you've got a big break in between clients, or maybe you're only seeing one a day, right after the session, it's perfect. This is when the information is still very fresh. You know, everything's gonna be there in your mind. You'll remember all of the details of the techniques and the muscles you worked on. So in a perfect world, this is actually when you would write them. Now, that being said is a lot of the time, people don't have the time to do this. You either book back to back or that time in between clients, you need a break. You just need to shake it off, maybe go outside, take a breath of fresh air, right? So there's a lot of reasons why this isn't ideal. Which brings us to the last one, at the end of the day. Now, personally, I tend to do it at the end of the day with one exception if I've treated a really complex case. Now, that being said, with what I do, because of course I do massage and acupuncture and, and a few other things, is on occasion I get these ridiculously complicated cases where there's just so many details that if I don't write it down right there, I'm probably going to forget something important. So in those cases, I write it down right after the session. Now, quite frankly, the vast majority of the time, I set aside a certain period of time at the end of the day. Now, for myself, that usually takes me five minutes per client. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but on average, five minutes. Now, that's an important thing to know is how long it takes you to write your soap notes because you budget that into your time. Now, with that being said, this is a bit of a side note, maybe a tangent, but it's important nonetheless, is remember that when you're massaging a client is, Yes, you're massaging them for an hour. So you might think that maybe you charge $100 per hour massage. Let's just keep the numbers simple. And let's also assume you're practicing on your own and let's make it even more simple and say you're practicing out of your house so there's no overhead. So you're thinking, I make $100 an hour, but the reality is it's actually probably closer to $100 every hour and a half. Because although they're on the table for an hour, you still have to consider you've set the room up, you've got to clean the room, you've got to do the laundry, and you've got to take your soap notes. So for every one client, it's usually closer to an hour and a half for a 60 minute session or closer to two hours for a 90 minute session. It's kind of strange to think of it that way, but it's important to start thinking about the fact that there's more to your job and it actually is part of your job that has to be accounted for than just giving a massage. The administrative duties, the, the fact that you need to write soap notes and all of those other little things. So. That is to say, at the end of the day, that's my preferred time. Uh, actually, I think, no, I think that's all I do have to say on that. I just want to make sure that we're clear. You can write them anytime, end of the day. You could even write them at the end of the week, technically. I don't suggest it. You're probably going to forget a lot of things, so probably not at the end of the week. But take your time at the end. Now, time is the big thing, and we are going to talk about that, because if you've seen six people in a day and... Maybe you you're, want to be incredibly detailed and each one of those six people takes you 10 minutes or yeah, 10 minutes per person. That's an extra hour of your day. That, that's a lot of time. So we do need to discuss how we actually shrink this process down. Maybe you are an individual who does take 10 minutes. And if that's what it takes you, that's what it takes you. That's just part of the job. And yeah, it might suck because you don't like writing all the soap notes, but it's part of the gig. However, there are ways that we can shrink this down quite considerably, which we'll talk about shortly. I, um, yes, we'll talk about that shortly. Actually, we'll talk about it right now. I missed the slide here. So we'll talk about speeding things up. Abbreviations are 100% acceptable. You can go ahead and use abbreviations all you want. I mean, for myofascial release, it might be MFR. For a deep tissue, it might be D. DTX or whatever you decide it is. And you can decide on what these abbreviations are and they are very helpful. They speed things up tremendously. Uh, I even have abbreviations for, for most muscles. Hamstrings, HMX, 
that's hamstrings. Quadriceps, well, for me, that's just quads because it's short enough, right? Uh, levator, LVT. So I've got shorthand for all of the muscles I work on. I also have shorthand for the ma vast majority of techniques that I do. Myofascial release, MFR, deep tissue, trigger points. So you can come up with all of these abbreviations. And when you've memorized them, it speeds things up tremendously. As I said before, though, you cannot speed things up by simply saying the same as last week. Not good. Can't do that. If you're using an electronic health record system, on the other hand, you can copy and paste. If it was indeed the exact same as last week, copy and paste, totally fine, 100% legitimate. In fact, some electronic health records let you hit the button that says import from last week, and automatically everything gets imported from last week, including the subject of object of assessment plan, everything gets imported and you could just make little tweaks. That speeds things up hugely. For my clients that I see on a weekly or even monthly basis, I use that function often. And it takes my soap notes from that five minutes to like 30 seconds. Hit that button, make a few adjustments, read through it, we're fine, off you go. So that does speed things up. So don't be afraid to copy and paste, but again, that only works if you're using electronic health records. Now here is a list of abbreviations, and this isn't anything special. I literally just got this off of Google. So you can Google search abbreviations for massage therapy. If you've got that big green Rattray book from school, you know, the principles of massage or whatever it's called, there's a bunch of abbreviations in there as well. But with all of that being said, there is something that's very important about abbreviations. Go ahead and use them. You have to have a legend. Now, if you're taking paper notes, that legend must be at the beginning of every single file for paper notes. If you're taking them on computer, you can have that legend saved somewhere so as long as you can quickly print it out. If you add a new abbreviation to your soap notes, you have to add it to your legend. This legend is essential when providing soap notes for any legal reasons. So I can't stress that enough. Abbreviations, awesome. Use them by all means but make sure you have a legend. So then some best practices. One, if you're writing by hand, write clearly. You are legally only allowed to use blue or black ink. You are not allowed to use pencil. You're not allowed to use red. You're not allowed to use purple. It has to be blue or black. Again, these are legal documents, and it turns out that that's part of a legal document, blue or black ink. Do not use whiteout if this is all based on paper notes. You cannot use whiteout if, again, this gets called to you to court and a judge sees whiteout on a page, it, that, that page doesn't count. It's no longer viable evidence. If you're going to rewrite something or you made a mistake, you double line cross it out. You can single line too. You double line cross it out and you put a little initial beside it. That's how you make a change. Even if it's an entire sentence, double line cross it out or single line, write your initials and then sign at the bottom. Now that's super important thing. Paper notes has to be signed at the bottom and it has to be signed at the, at the next available line at the bottom of your soap notes. What I mean is if you've written six lines, like six lines on your page, a uh, piece of paper, your signature has to be on the seventh. And on that note, the diff, uh, the, there can be no space between subject of objective assessment and plan no free spaces. And the reason is because if there's a free space, you can technically go back and add something in later, which you are not allowed to do. If you write your soap notes, you sign it, and then you remember something two days later that's super important, you have to make a new date, a new entry, and sign it again. And that's, that's all legal things. So you, you have to sign at the bottom, and again, the next available line. You can't skip a line. Cool. So that's our, our soap notes basics, right? This is again, a sir, I'm sure I'm something you're very familiar with, but I hope there was some helpful tips and reminders in there. Subjective, detailed explanation. It's their own words, their subjective experience. And the more detail you get here, the better, particularly in that first session. The objective part, this is your objective findings. This is where you can write your opinion if you want, but the object, no, sorry, your opinion goes in the next part. My apologies. The objective findings are purely objective, pain found on special tests, your orthopedic assessment, all of that stuff. 
And then we get into the assessment. This is where you can write your subjective opinion. I believe, I think, this is what I believe it to be. And you're also, in this part, going to write the progress that your client has been making. And lastly, when we get into plan, this is what you did, what your plan is for the future sessions, and what their home care is. So that plan part, that's going to take the majority of the time. Now we're going to move into talking about electronic health records. Uh, so again, ask questions. I'm going to keep an eye on the chat. If you have any questions about the, the soap note taking portion, uh, we'll, we'll get into that. But if not, we'll, we'll go through the electronic health records. Okay, electronic health records. Why go electronic, what provider, and how to set things up? We're not going to go through all of these details, but I'll, I'll start off by talking about why go electronic. Electronic health records, in my opinion, are one of the best things to happen to our industry. And I mean, that made it sound like I'm exaggerating and I'm being, uh, being a little bit over the top, but I don't think there are many things that have made my life easier, a practitioner, more so than electronic health records. I'm a huge fan. If you're taking paper notes, by all means, continue. You've got your system, great. Uh, but when we talk about legalities, I'm going to make another case why that's probably not ideal. With that said, I strongly encourage all practitioners to shift into electronic health records. It makes things so much easier for a million different reasons. But when you do switch, or if you do choose to switch to an electronic health record, so it's EHR, that's electronic health record, or EMR, electronic medical record. These are used basically interchangeably. I'm just going to say EHR instead of saying electronic health record moving forward. So... Oh, that's the wrong slide. I apologize. Ah, HIPAA and PIPIDA. We have to make sure that the uh, EHR system is HIPAA or PIPIDA compliant. That's the first and most important thing when we're talking about electronic health records. So the HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act in the United States. In Canada, we call it PIPIDA, which is Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. They're basically the same thing, HIPAA and PIPIDA. Essentially, this means there's this universal compliance thing to it. I'm not going to read all of this, it's not necessarily that important, but it essentially protects you from fraud, it protects the clients from having their information sold, it protects from, uh, with, uh, with privacy, it also protects from any hackers or anybody getting access to this private information. So essentially, HIPAA and PIPIDA, without going into details of all the legalities, it means that it's following standards that are required for legal documents. Now, HIPAA and PIPIDA, it's not just for soap notes. It's also involved in any type of online or electronic legal document. So when you do choose an electronic health record service, make sure that they're HIPAA or PIPIDA compliant. Now, chances are it's not going to say PIPIDA. It's not going to be specific to Canada because HIPAA, the American version, it's universal. If something says HIPAA or HIPAA compliant, it's also good in Canada. So if you're going through some sort of EHR website and it only says HIPAA, no problem. It's still good in Canada. I promise. And without HIPAA, if you are taking documents electronically and it is not HIPAA compliant, you can get into some pretty serious legal trouble. So I really want to emphasize how important this is. Now, as far as legal trouble, somebody's going to have to figure out that it happened, meaning there will have to be a breach in security. Essentially, somebody hacks into your computer and gets documents that they shouldn't. Now, this can happen, right? Hacking happens all the time. For example, ransomware. This is something where somebody will access your material or your computer and they will say, if you don't pay me, I don't know, a couple thousand dollars, then I'm going to delete everything or you're never going to get access to your files again. If that happens, even if you get access to your files, maybe you pay them, whatever happens, you get access to your computer back. If that happens, you legally have to contact every single one of your clients and tell them that their information has been stolen. That doesn't sound like very much fun. So make sure that your software is HIPAA compliant. Cannot emphasize that enough. So we'll talk about HIPAA compliant software and a few options. One, you can actually use Google Docs but it's only with G Suite or what's now called Google Workspace. Workspace or Workplace? I think it's Workspace. G Suite or Google Workspace. 
If you just have a regular old standard Gmail account with standard Google Docs, that is not HIPAA compliant. So if you're taking SOAP notes on Google Docs and it is not HIPAA or it's not G Suite or you're not paying monthly for it, no bueno, doesn't work. It's not HIPAA compliant and you could get into some serious trouble. With that said, if you pay the minimum fee, and I'm pretty sure with Google Workspace, it's like $5 a month or $7 a month or something like that. It's, it's a minimal fee. Fair game, go ahead, keep all of your SOAP notes in Google Docs. Uh, you can password protect them. Everything is totally legit and above the board. Now, without getting too far off track, it's actually a pretty good investment. That $7 a month gives you access to the whole Google Workspace suite, which is very helpful as a business owner. So that's one of the first suggestions I, I typically give, and it's incredibly low cost. So very low cost, safe, legal way of doing it. What about Microsoft Word? Well, with Microsoft Word, you can store your documents on OneDrive, on, on the cloud. And if you do that, it does not work. It's not allowed because Microsoft OneDrive is not HIPAA compliant, even if you pay, not HIPAA compliant. On the other hand, if you store all of those Microsoft Word documents on your own computer, on a thumb drive, on a hard drive, something like that, you can password protect them. So if you password protected each individual document, you're okay. That's following HIPAA compliant. It's simple password protection. For me, that is so suboptimal, I would have zero desire to do that. Every time I want to get into a note, I've got to set up a password. It's a nightmare. I wouldn't want to do that. But if you choose to, go for it. Use Microsoft Word. Has to be password protected. Next, then, oh, that says her, that should say EHR, sorry for that mistake. Online electronic health record systems. Uh, make sure to check before signing up. Uh, there's a ton of them. There's more and more online EHR systems all the time. Just double check and make sure that it's HIPAA or PIPA compliant. And this is something that these electronic health record services are very happy to advertise. So it should be incredibly obvious. If it's not obvious, you could try emailing them, but if it's not obvious, I wouldn't suggest going with that particular company. So here's a quick breakdown. G Suite, advantages. Uh, that's going to be inexpensive, incredibly easy to use, it's minimal to no setup. It's all cloud-based, so you don't have to worry about if a hard drive crashes or your computer dies or something like that. It's cloud-based, easy as. Disadvantages. This is limited for communication with clients, meaning you don't get to communicate with clients directly through G Suite. You can go through Gmail, but it's an additional step. Uh, also, G Suite does not have any booking software built into it, and that's one of the huge advantages of electronic health records, which I think we'll get into, yeah, we'll get into next. Um, so, uh, organization and database issues are, are challenging if you've got a larger practice. In fact, if you've got a practice with more than one practitioner, I would strongly discourage you from using Google. Very strongly. If it's just you, solo, you're doing a little mobile, maybe you work out of your house, that's yeah, fine. It's fine. You practice for a couple of years, this is gonna become a bit of a nightmare. Keeping track of all the different clients, their files, their invoices, it just gets tricky. So advantages, yes, disadvantages, certainly. Microsoft Word, inexpensive, more expensive than Google, mind you, but inexpensive, easy to use, minimal setup. Uh, now disadvantages are, are same thing, limited communication. Organization and database issues, same thing, and it's server-based only, which means if your computer goes down and it's all on the same hard drive, you've lost all of your client files. So you do, in fact, yes, legally speaking, I should be more specific, different associations and regulations have different guidelines behind this, but the very vast majority state that if you are keeping your, your health records on a local drive, you have to have backups. And I'm pretty sure the backups need to be done weekly. It might be longer than that, but I'm pretty confident those backups need to happen weekly. Which means you now need to have a backup hard drive that's kept in a waterproof, fireproof container. So a bit of a nightmare if you're keeping them on a local drive or local server. And then that takes us into electronic health records. They're cloud-based, and they often include other services like booking, communication, billing, all of those other things. And now I can go way, way deep on this because, again, that's something that makes your life so much easier. If you've got a really good booking system and a phenomenal accounting system and billing system, 
all built into one, your life is so much easier. So for that reason, amongst other, I, I think just, just go with an electronic health record system. So the advantages are obvious. There are disadvantages though. They're more expensive, no question. The least expensive one I've ever found, I think was $19 a month. I think that was Noterra. Uh, don't quote me on that because prices change all the time, but the least expensive is around that $20 mark. However, for that $20 mark, you're not getting much more than you would with Google Docs, right? It's a very basic soap note system. You don't get all of the other advantages like accounting software and booking software and things like that. So they certainly can be more expensive. Uh, oh, next note is setup takes more time. There's an onboarding process, no question. You've got to make sure your entire clinic is set up, but for a lot of them, you can actually book a time with one of their specialists that will walk you through the system. Um, and you could even hire somebody to do it for you if you really wanted. A couple hours is all it takes, and it's a couple hours well invested. And management is required. What I mean by management is required, you just need to make sure that things are working properly. Because it is an integrated system, you might need to connect it with your QuickBooks, your accounting software, or with your bank account, right? And then you're going to have to set up other things, like if you do collect payments through the system, you got to set up a Stripe account and a PayPal account, which all these things sound like a big deal, but they're not. They don't take that long, and as a business owner in this modern world, you kind of need them. So I'm not trying to sell anything by any means. You don't have to use these, but I'm sure you can tell I'm a huge fan. I think they're well worth the time and investment. Um, my opinion is, as a practitioner, if you're practicing on your own, you've got your own clinic somewhere, this should be one of the first investments that you make. And if you're working for a different clinic and they don't have an electronic health record system, beg them for one because it's well within their best interest. Now, with all of that being said, just very briefly, um, one of the ones I love the most is Jane. Um, there's a lot of different systems, so I'm not saying this is the best by any means, it's just my preference. And if you do want and you haven't signed up, you can sign up for Jane. Use the code AIM1MO and you can get your first, first month free. Uh, I do have a partner program through them and they're, they're amazing. I work closely with them on courses and videos, so they're a great service and if you are interested, uh, you can use Jane. Now, I do see a question here from Katie. Uh, Wildfire Wellness, Natero has booking system. Yes, Natero is, is great. Phenomenal system. Uh, I actually used Natero for quite a while, and I think it's, it's really one of the best out there. I, I don't have a partnership with them, but I know Massage Therapy Media does. They're this really great company out of Ontario. I know that they've got a partnership with Natero, so you might be able to reach out to them, and, uh, and maybe they've got a discount code or something for you as well. Uh, one that I've also used quite a bit is called Massage Book, and it's great if all you do is massage. Um, yes, I think, yeah, when you sign up, use AIM10. I think it is AIM10, actually. Uh, and you can get 10% off your first year with Massage Book. Uh, they're, they're a great company as well, so... Electronic health records, lots of options, and I could probably spend another two hours talking just about EHR systems uh, and all the different types and reviewing. Maybe that's what I'll do one day. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll make a YouTube video where I compare different electronic health records because uh, there, there's a lot to be said about it. All right. Cool. That's going to take us into legalities. This is actually probably the most important part of this discussion, as I'm sure understanding how to write soap notes is review for many people, but this is something that, if forgotten, can have pretty dire consequences. As I mentioned, soap notes are indeed legal forms and legal documents, and they have to be treated as such. Not keeping proper soap notes uh, uh, is grounds for delisting. Now, delisting means you're delisted from insurance companies. So, for example, um, maybe Manulife. If Manulife figures out that you're not keeping proper soap notes for ver through a variety of different means, then they will no longer accept you as a massage therapist. Even if you've got the registration and insurance, you know, you're with one of the associations. If you're not taking proper soap notes, then one of the health insurance companies can delist you. Now, additionally, if you're not taking proper soap notes and your association or your regulatory body finds out, they can suspend your license or entirely revoke your license. So this could indeed lead to suspending of a license, which of course nobody wants. 
So if for no other reason than this, take soap notes. Now, I'd be lying if I said that they don't really care the quality of your soap notes. It doesn't have to be the best soap notes. You just have to take them. Of course, you know how I feel about it. Take high quality soap notes, nevertheless. Now, Ontario, for example, uh, they require uh, their clinicians to keep records for 10 years past the last time you saw a client or their 18th birthday. It gets a little bit complicated and it's not necessary for Albertans to know because, of course, we don't have any of these. BC has the same rules, but I do present this because even though we don't have the same rules as these regulated provinces, we likely will one day. I might be wishful thinking, right? I mean, that whole regulatory conversation is a long one, but maybe one day we do get regulated and we suddenly have to start keeping these records. And if that's the case and you've already been doing it, perfect, you're ahead of the game. Now, I should also mention, if you are keeping paper notes, you do have to keep them. Even though we're not regulated, as it is a legal document, you have to keep it for a minimum of three years. All legal documents have to be kept for three years, right? Five is better, 10 is even better, right? So if you're suddenly having to keep all of your client's files for three years, that's a lot of paperwork to store. And here's the kicker. It actually has to be kept in a filing cabinet, a metal fireproof filing cabinet, and ideally it's waterproof as well, but fireproof is the most essential. So you see paper documents, it's, it's a nightmare. It's a big pain, pain in the butt, so. Another case for going electronic health records. All right, so let's talk about uh, legal letters. Every once in a while, not so often, massage therapists can be asked to show their documentation, to show their soap notes. And there could be a number of reasons why. Uh, motor vehicle accidents are amongst the most common. Other reasons might be somebody is going through an insurance process for some other reason, you know, maybe it's a sports industry injury or some reason they're going through insurance. And the insurance provider is oftentimes going to be the one that asks for a soap note. Now, what's important about that is the insurance provider is the one who wants a soap note, but the insurance provider actually has to go through a lawyer that then goes through the client that then can talk to you. So it's a long-winded way of saying that it doesn't matter who's asking for the documentation, it has to eventually make its way through a lawyer. Now, as such, you are indeed compelled legally to provide this information as they are healthcare documents and you are a healthcare professional. You cannot say no. So if you are presented with a letter that says, we request all information about John Smith between these two dates, you have to provide that information. Professionalism is key. This is very important for our profession in general. So we'll talk about how to maintain that professionalism. Now, if you get a request, and I say court request, but these requests, again, they could come from uh, the insurance companies with an attached lawyer document, or they could come directly from a lawyer. Treatment notes, they must be legible, they must be dated, and they must be signed. If they are paper, these all count. Now, if they're digital, I didn't talk about this with electronic health records. Uh, electronic health records, as soon as you hit save, it creates a digital signature, which then means it cannot be changed without creating another digital signature. So of course you don't have to sign an electronic health record. So they are naturally signed, dated, and they should be legible if you're using, well, no, they will be legible, right? So electronic health records, this is, this is a given. Must be legible, must be dated, must be signed. Uh, signed consent from the patient is 100% required inequivocal, no matter what. If you get a letter from a lawyer, and it doesn't matter if it's your patient's lawyer or somebody else's lawyer, and that document says, we require these documents from John Doe between this date, this date, blah, blah, blah. Fine. But they also have to provide you with a signed document from your patient or client. And if they don't provide you with one, then you can say, no, I don't have permission from the client. And then they will go get it. Now, if you really want to, I don't suggest this, but you can contact the client yourself. You can ring them up and say, hey, I just got a call from this lawyer. They want your documents. Do I have your approval? If they say yes, it's not enough. They need to email you or fax you. Do people fax anymore? They need to email you or come in and hand deliver a signed document that says, I acknowledge and agree to the fact that you are going to be providing my documents to such and such a lawyer. 
uh, Alyssa says BC, 16 years. Uh, yeah. So in BC, the documents, uh, it's, I'll go back to that slide quickly. Uh, I know this is, this is late, but the, uh, they take a long time. Yes, they must be 16 years from the date of the last treatments or the patient's 19th birthday. That's, that's an incredible amount of time. So what that means is, let's say, um, I mean, it's easy enough if you've been treating a client and you stop treating them, you just count 16 years from that date. But if you're working on somebody under the age of 18, let's say they're, I don't know, or sorry, 19, let's say that they're 15. In that case, you have to keep the documents for 20 years. 20 years, because it's 16 years past their 19th birthday. Yeah, it's it's crazy, it's crazy. The, the legalities and the rules in BC are, are mind numbing. A number of times I've uh, worked, uh, gone in to get continuing education courses approved in BC, and it's it's a nightmare. It's not even worth it for the most part. It's just so challenging working with the BC Association. Pros to that, good things, right? Like it definitely maintains an incredibly high standard of the profession, but on the other hand, and I might be speaking on a turn here, maybe, just maybe, taking themselves a little bit too seriously because, I mean, a lot of the medical professions, like even physiotherapists, don't have to keep it, depending on where they are, but keep their documents for that long. So it's crazy. It's crazy. All right, let's get back to this. Signed consent form from patient release. Yes, it must be signed. Now, another another possibility, not necessarily a court request, but maybe a doctor request, right? Maybe the doctor, you know, or maybe it's a physiotherapist or it's another practitioner. You might get a call one day from me, maybe, and I call you up and I'm like, oh, uh, hey, hey, Alyssa, I, I have a question for you. I just started seeing this client and uh, I, I need a copy of the soap notes or I would like to see the soap notes. And then you say, yeah, sure, no problem. So I call you up and ask you that question. You cannot give me those soap notes until you've called the client and been like, hey, John, so you're seeing Dr. Jess right now. He's requested a copy of your soap notes. Is it okay if I give those soap notes? Yes, great. I'm gonna quickly email you this document. You just gotta sign it and send it back to me. So if I ask you for the soap notes, you still have to get a signed letter from the patient or the client. The only exception to this rule is if you're within the same clinic. If it's in the same filing cabinet, it's fair game. You're allowed to look through it then, but that's it. If you're not in the same clinic, you need a signed document from the client. Now, rarely, very rarely, you might actually be called to testify in court, meaning you're called into court to be a professional witness. The likelihood of this happening is very, very low for a number of reasons. One, professional witnesses, yeah, professional witnesses, they're expensive. If you get called to be a professional witness, then whoever is calling you has to pay you. So it's expensive, meaning people typically only call professional witnesses if they're 100% required. And additionally, they're typically going to be looking for other professional witnesses before calling in a massage therapist. If somebody is going through an insurance case, they're probably going to call in the overseeing MD long before they're gonna call in a massage therapist. But it might happen, they might call you in. If you're testifying in court, you're gonna be asked about the nature and substance of your opinion. Meaning, why are you a professional? What gives you the right to actually have an opinion that's considered professional? In such a case, you would just list out your accreditation and your credentials. And you might be cross-examined by the opposite lawyer, and then again, it's just questioning you. Which is to say, if you're honest in your soap notes, and you're not trying to, to cut any corners, you're not trying to do anything fishy, this is not a problem at all. Uh, you, can, you can answer these questions without hesitation, without any worry, because you've kept good quality soap notes, you've been honest from one end to another, so there's nothing to worry about. And again, the likelihood is minimal. And as I said, you can charge from your, for your time at your hourly rate. It gets a little bit tricky though, if you're working for another clinic, like let's say the clinic charges $100 per massage and you get 60% of that. Do you charge $100 or do you charge 60? And quite frankly, that's entirely up to you. All right, we have a question here coming from Jody. And the question is, what is the legalities to looking at other therapists and Cairo's notes in the same clinic? If it's in the same filing cabinet, it's acceptable. Now that being said, it's acceptable with manual medicine modalities. What I mean is, 
If a chiropractor is performing manual medicine, they're treating frozen shoulder, and you're also treating frozen shoulder, you can look at those notes and the chiro can look at yours. However, if you're working in a clinic with, say, an acupuncturist and the acupuncturist is treating fertility issues and you're treating the same client for frozen shoulder, you cannot look at those records. So it's very tricky when it comes to what's being practiced. So while yes, it is allowable, more often than not, they're not going to be crossed over. There's going to be a file for the chiro, a file for the um, massage therapist, a file for the acupuncturist. And if it's electronic health records, then each session, if it's the same client coming, they're going to be booked with a different practitioner under a different modality. And when you look at the notes as a massage therapist, you are not going to see the chiropractic notes. Now, electronic health records can allow that. You can click a little button that says, let practitioners see all the notes. But most, excuse me, most of the time, they're very much kept separate. So while it is allowed, Man, people usually don't do it because there can oftentimes be information that a person tells a different practitioner that they don't want the massage therapist to know or vice versa something that they don't want the car or don't think the car should know so a kind of a gray area there i wish that there was a, a better answer but legalities no legalities if it is the same condition legalities if it is a different condition and that's when it gets tricky because it's like when I see somebody, maybe I'm treating somebody for a fertility issue and they have a shoulder issue, I'm probably going to be putting in needles and fertility stuff and I'll throw a couple needles in for the shoulder too. So I'm going to have this mishmash of notes and be like, here's all the notes on fertility and here's all the notes on shoulder issues. So then when a massage therapist looks at my notes, are they actually allowed to? Well, I mean, kind of, if they kind of squint one eye, blah, <laughs> you see what I mean? Gets tricky. So those are the legalities. Advice, don't cross pollinate. Keep your notes separate. If you are working in a clinic with a different practitioner, you can ask to look at the notes or you can ask for a summary or their professional opinion. If it's the same modality, 100% fair game, totally fair game from practice. If it's a bunch of massage therapists, then all the massage therapists are allowed to look at the same soap notes because the scope of practice is identical. Same thing with acupuncturists, chirals, you see what I mean there. Now, I hope that answered your question in, in detail. And if not, then again, there's that huge leg, but uh, just say, you didn't answer it, try again. If not, give me a thumbs up, but I'll, I'll keep an eye on that, that note there. All right, so you can charge for your time and your time, uh, what I was gonna say is, uh, do you charge for the percentage you're making? Do you charge for the full amount? That's nah, actually entirely up to you, whatever you think is fair. Quite frankly, I would charge for my full time. If a treatment for me costs $100, whether or not I'm working for my clinic, $100 per hour of time. Uh, that does not include travel time to and from court. That includes the amount of time that you are in court. If you are called to be at court at 1030, that's when the clock starts, not the time it took to get down there. That's it, which is pretty self-explanatory. Chart notes and copies. Now, this is a big question that, that I see come up a lot on Facebook groups, and I get asked this often. So you've been contacted. You, you have to provide your soap notes. What do you supply? What do you provide? Well, you supply only what is requested and only for the dates. So if you've been seeing a client for five years and they got into a car accident last month or two months ago and you've seen them three times, you only give the soap notes that are relevant to that car accident. So only what's supplied. You don't have to give any more. Certainly don't give any less. If they request your whole file, do not include reports or correspondences paid for other parties. What I mean by this is, is if somebody else, some other insurance company or some other company has already asked for a copy of the files, you can't give those ones. You have to start fresh. Next, if they request a transcription of your notes or further elaboration, you may charge an extra fee. So that is to say, if you've used a lot of shorthand, or I mean, for example, with what I do with acupuncture, even if I'm running longhand, it doesn't make sense to 90% of people, you know, and be like, uh, Jody came in and was suffering from liver cheese stagnation and uh, spleen blood deficiency. Uh, there was, you know, notable signs of blah, 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 blah. Like, a lawyer is going to look at that and be like, what are you even talking about? So they might call me and be like, can you translate this into normal talk? In such a case, 
I've written clearly, everything is above the board, but they don't understand it. I can then translate it to them and I could charge a fee for that. Additionally, if you've used a ton of shorthand and abbreviations and you need to expand on it, you can charge your time for your time as well. But if you've provided them with a legend, you typically don't have to do that and they won't ask for it. How much can you charge for this? That's a very important question. How much time did it take you to come up with all of this information? And the going rate is $60 plus 30 cents per sheet charged. Now that's assuming, I mean, $60 plus is a bit much because I, I believe, and I've been asked a bunch of times to do this now. I've worked a lot of different insurance cases is I charge for my time. And since I use electronic health records, for me, it's like, you need the, my client notes from this state to this state, no problem. I go in, hit the export button, hit filter, this state to this state, hit export, download the file, send an email. Honestly, it takes me no more than five minutes. And it really shouldn't take you more than that either if you're using electronic health records. It's so simple to provide these, these, uh, these notes. So I'll, I'll charge a half hour of my time because I don't, I don't really want to charge less than that. So whatever that works out. I mean, once I actually charged $30 or something like that, just as minimal fee as I possibly could because it was like, this took seconds, not even minutes. So I really try and keep it reasonable. I, I don't see any reason whatsoever to try and get as much money out of this process as you can. It just makes everybody's job more challenging. So just be reasonable about it. If you're using paper notes, it's a totally different situation. You can then charge 30 cents per copy of paper plus all of the, um, the time it took you to make the copies. But again, not many people do use paper. So $60, give or take, plus, and you could do 30 cents per sheet copying fee. Um, and you know what? What's interesting is uh, I've when I was contacted, actually last several times I was contacted for this, they wanted a scanned copy anyways. So even if I had paper copies, I, I couldn't, sorry, even if I was using paper, I would have to provide a digital copy, meaning scanning them also. Just easier if you're using electronic health records. So that's it. Reasonable cost, that's the most important note. How long did it actually take you? How much time did it take you to get these notes together? Probably not that much time, particularly if you're well organized. All right. Patient privacy, this is essential. Again, only relevant necessary information about your patients. Claimants can be collected, used, or disclosed. Uh, for massage therapists, this isn't that challenging because we don't collect a lot of personal information and the information that you do collect is almost always gonna be directly related to the case you're working on. For different practitioners, it gets a bit challenging, right? Like if I am working with somebody with whiplash, uh, and simultaneously, I'm also working with digestive problems. I can't give the notes regarding the digestive problems. But again, as a massage therapist, uh, it doesn't really matter for you, so don't worry about it too much. You must have a release form. We've already talked about that at length. You have to have a release form from your client. They need to know what you're doing at all times. And keep all documentation in the client's file. So if, uh, if you are called upon to do this um, by, by a lawyer, some electronic health records will allow you to make a note on a client's file. Just a, a note that says, was uh, made copies for such and such a case and such and such a date. Most of them will allow you to make a note on the electronic health record file. For those that don't, you can simply make a new SOAP note and in the subject of part, write all the details. That's what you can do just to make sure that, that you've got it documented within their file. With paper notes, Easy enough, you just write it down, type it out, print it, whatever you want to do, and keep it in their file. Last note, and then we're going to get into Q&A if there are any, but we've been doing a great job of asking questions as we've gone through this. Record keeping for MVA clients, motor vehicle accident clients, they tend to be by far the most complicated, so maybe you want to do things a little bit different. I'd encourage you to do a totally different intake for MVA client histories. Uh, this is another huge conversation, but if you have somebody coming in for an MVA, don't use the same SOAP form that you would for everything else. Have a separate one, have something totally different. One that's very specific to motor vehicle accidents because you need so much more information. And if somebody has been in an MVA and they're going through insurance policies and there's legal issues, you need so much detail. And this is incredibly helpful for your client, but also the insurance companies, like I mentioned previously. Maybe your client makes it through their 21 sessions and they legitimately do need more work. 
Well, your soap notes might be the thing that gets them there. After your 20th session, you've kept really detailed soap notes and you've done so because you know it's an MVA and you've done your assessments and you've just nailed it and you get to the 20th session and you're like, this person is not improving. And they go back to their insurance company and they say, I want more sessions. Well, the insurance company might contact you and they might say, this person wants more, more sessions. What do you think? Based on your super detailed notes, you can give a very high quality opinion. Now the opposite, as I said, is true. And I've actually had this happen almost as often. An insurance company says, so-and-so is asking for more treatments. What's your opinion? And I look at my soap notes and I see the progress we've been making. And we've been making great progress. And I'll say to the insurance company, according to my records, this, this client made phenomenal progress. Like they were doing really, really well. The last time I saw them, X number of months ago, they were doing great. So based on what I have seen, they don't actually need more sessions, which kind of seems like you're you know, stabbing your client in the back, right? Like they might need more, but the fact is your soap notes were saying they're making progress. So your discretion, what you want to do in such a situation, nevertheless, with MVAs, keep very specific notes. Ask MVA clients to come in a minimum of 10 minutes early on the first session to complete any additional paperwork. And with an MVA client, you might want to tell them, maybe you've got a 60 minute session booked. You might want to tell them uh, every single time you come in, we need to take five minutes and do an assessment. And I do think that's within your best interest. Do an assessment every session with an MVA client. Even if it is super brief, keep those rigorous notes. Yes, a lot of extra time for assessment. All right, and that's it. That brings us to the end. So that was, uh, that was a lot of information in a very short period of time. I certainly hope it was helpful. I, I welcome any and all questions. So as, uh, as we wait for you know, the, the Facebook lag to catch up, uh, think of questions, fire away any questions you have, any comments. What I also appreciate is um, ways that I can prove this next time. I'll be doing the same session again in a couple weeks for, for um, Massage Therapy Media. So any suggestions you have would be awesome as well. Yeah, just fire away. I suppose one thing I could mention while I'm waiting for clients, uh, or not clients, while I'm waiting for any questions, and if I don't see any come up, then after I finish this last uh, discussion, I'll just end the, the, the session. But um, we do have a course called Foundations of Orthopedic Assessment, and I certainly don't want this to turn into a sales pitch, so please don't interpret it as such. However, if you do want to learn more about this process, the whole assessment intake process, then Foundations of Orthopedic Assessment is a great place to start. And I think I can, uh, I'll throw up a link here to, uh, to Foundations. So within Foundations of Orthopedic Assessment, basically what we go through is all of this stuff that I just talked about. Um, yeah, all the, the inquiry stuff, we talk about how to ask the questions, what questions to ask. Um, it's essentially a six hour course on what orthopedic assessment is and best practices. And we also have another one which takes you through how to do all of the, uh, the assessments like physical assessment portions as well. So I'm just going to bring up that, uh, and I don't see any questions yet. We're doing good. Oh, there we go. Lori's got a question. Thank you so much. Well, I'm happy, happy to help Lori anytime. My pleasure as always. And uh, so the link that I am bringing up, um, it'll be for a, a discounted price. And if there are any clinic owners in the, uh, in the session today, send me a message and I can uh, provide you another package deal. So if you want to, you're a clinic owner and you want your entire staff to take this course or anything like that, just send me a message and I'm, I'm happy to provide a package deal for, uh, for however many that you have. Well, that appears to be it then with no other questions coming in. And of course, if any question does come up, send me a Facebook message, email me. You've got my email. It's jess at aimonline.com. I'll type it in right now. Aim Happy to answer any question whatsoever. Truly, I, I enjoy it. So, so don't be a stranger. Uh, thank you for joining. And with that, I think we will say good night.